Um, so my background today, um, we um, built out from our basement. We had a full basement door and we built out from there and put in a little patio and a root cellar. And then of course, over the root cellar, I wanted a green roof. So this is the sedum green roof that we have and, um, and it's flowering. So it's really, this is its first year and it's really cool. So, so that's my background for today. Every day I do another background. All right, so hi everybody. I'm Wendy Murdoch and this is Webinars with Wendy. I've been bringing you amazing people to understand more about the horse so that you can have a better connection than do right by your horse using the modern day veterinary care and the latest techniques. Um, one of the key aspects in veterinary care is the veterinary technician. And so today I've asked, I've asked Penny to join us from Delaney Vet Clinic to talk about how you can use Surefoot in as a vet tech. Um, I think this is an area that we're gonna see growing. And I know that over in Europe, we have a lot of physical therapists. That's actually a profession in Europe is animal physical therapist. Um, we don't have the same title in this country, but we do have in the United States, two places where they're teaching people to be rehab specialists. And that's um, Arlen White's down in Florida and at Stephen Adair's, Dr. Stephen Adair at UT Tennessee in Knoxville. So that the concept of physical therapy and rehab in horses is definitely expanding. And there's a lot of veterinarians and centers where you can find places to send your horse for rehabilitation. But in vet practice, I think it's the role of the vet tech, and this is where Penny's gonna help me out the role of the vet tech to be part of that rehab um, specialist. So uh, welcome, Penny. Thank you so much for joining me. And you can let me know if I did a bad job on that. <laughs> no, you did a great job, Wendy. Thank you so much. <laughs> We're the unsung heroes. No, I'm kidding. Um, I think most veterinarians value their veterinary technologists and uh, are in some yeah some places we're vet tech some places we're vet nurses so wherever you are um you are a valued member of the team and i think um often we have more time to spend with clients and explain things and talk to them about aftercare and all of that sort of thing so i think uh, so we really complement yeah before we get into vet tech let, just tell us a little bit about your background because you you have quite an extensive background uh, yes, of course. Um, so I started back in 2002 uh, down the, the program of, of an equine body worker through Equinology and uh, worked in that for a little while. It was still pretty new at the time. There weren't that many people doing it. So I felt like a bit of a pioneer. <laughs> so I can identify with what you're doing. Um, that I just felt like I needed to know more. So I went to and did the vet tech program at our local um, technical uh, institute and ended up somehow working in a uh, companion animal practice. Um, so really enjoyed that and then was attracted to, always been attracted to rehab. So I kind of veered off and I worked in general practice for a couple of years and then they were gracious enough to send me to the University of Tennessee to do my um, oh, certified wow. nine rehab to, uh, practitioner certification. So. That was about a year long process with case studies and coming back for the exam and I met so many great people through that experience. And then uh, ended up just exclusively doing rehab in the practice for about eight, eight or nine years, I guess. Um, all the while still dabbling in the horses because I, you know, that, that's where my heart is. Um, love my dogs, but my horses are just a whole other level. So always wanted to come back to that. And uh, in the meantime, I've taken a number of different um, courses along the way, myofascial fascial trigger point therapy down in, in uh, the woodlands with myopain seminars and Dr. Rick Wall. Um, I've done uh, medical massage for animals down with Narda Rod Robinson down in Colorado. Um, I've been really lucky to, to, to learn from some really great people and, along the way and, and certainly continued um, with some of the equinology programs as well, both canine and equine. So that's been really great. Um, and I think and we then with the last people know that you're in Canada. Because we didn't mention Oh, I am in Canada, <laughs> yes. I'm in uh, Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. <laughs> we finally have summer, so that's really nice. Uh, <laughs> and um, so recently, I guess uh, February of this year, I started with Delaney Veterinary Services just east of Sherwood Park, Alberta, and they're a busy uh, surgical referral practice uh, and they are 
adding uh, rehab to their program. So they asked me to come along and, and help develop that. So I'm pretty excited to, to get that going. And that's sort of when I started down the surefoot path because I've always worked with the dogs on various inflatable items, um, fit paws or toto fit or, you know, just physio pads and things like that. But I thought, why isn't there something for horses? So when I saw yours, <laughs> I got so excited, as you know, and said, I need some of these. So <laughs> I invested in a, in a full set so that I could start playing. And um, I've seen just amazing results so far already. And uh, I've been playing a little bit with the sure paws pads as well, because we, we grabbed some of those and I wanted to kind of see how those are working. So I might talk about a few cases. Oh, that would be awesome. Um, but primarily, I think I'm versus me at this point. So, so, so I assume that you wrote as a child, just. Yes, I actually, I was terrified of horses <laughs> until I was about 13. Uh, I was a city girl and then we moved to a small town and uh, a friend of mine had me out and said, you know, come see my horse. And I was just like, ooh, I don't know, I'm scared of them. And <laughs> and she would double me around the fields, cute little Arab, and, and I just fell in love and just thought, oh my gosh, this is amazing. So I started on that path and, you know, started with lessons and did the whole hunter jumper circuit when I was a young person and, and then, you know, got away from it for a while, came back and then dabbled in some dressage and um, I've been playing, I've got a, a 14 year old Andalusian mare who I've been playing with lots of different things. So we do we trail ride, we do working equitation now, we've done dressage, we've done all kinds of different things. So she's been my best teacher and She's been a good teacher through Surefoot as well because she is a mare and sometimes has her own opinions. Yeah. <laughs> and so the first yeah. time she really took to them and said, oh, okay, I'll do this for you. I was so excited because she um, resisted a little bit at first. And I am starting to notice that mares are a bit that way. They seem to be, um, much as I love them and I wouldn't trade her for anything, they seem to have almost resist a little bit initially and kind of need to see them uh, a few times before they really embrace them. They're a little more, I would say they're a little more skeptical and they'll dabble um, yeah. before they dive in. Yeah. Um, and and so, then they're all in. <laughs> that's right. When, I, when you get a mayor all in, she's totally all in. Yeah, exactly. So, exactly. Um, so in Canada, do you have, you have the title Vet Tech. Um, is there animal physical therapist in Canada? There is the Canadian Physiotherapy Association has um, their animal rehab division. So they offer courses through the animal rehab division of the Canadian Physiotherapy Association. So there are, that, that's strictly for physiotherapists. Um, any veterinarians or veter veterinary technologists who want to pursue rehab certification still have to go to the US and still have to do either the University of Tennessee or the CRI um, program or the uh, Animal Rehab Institute, I guess is the equivalent. Yeah, that's right. I, I forgot the name for a minute. So yeah, so so we don't have a, a government or we don't have a specific um, in the veterinary world. We don't have a specific place to train in Canada, although we've got some great people to learn from. Right, and so I think you know in Europe they're they're way ahead of us in this department in terms of rehabilitation and having people specific to help owners with rehab. Um, and so they have veterinarians and then um, they can use the title animal physical therapist. It is a profession and it's not uh, a name you can just simply use. In the United States, as I understand it, the term physical therapist has been locked up in the human world and it's been trademarked so that we can't use those words in terms uh, in referencing animals. Exactly. Yeah, it's the same here in Canada. We, right. That's why we use canine rehabilitation or equine re rehabilitation as, as the term because we're not allowed to use physical therapy PT physiotherapist because right. that is protected by and I think you know we're so many people are just so used to the idea of a physical therapist for people that they don't even realize that that's there isn't a, a equivalent in horses in the name there is in the function but not in the name and so they've right. had to rename it uh, I, I think rehab specialist is, I, I, can you tell us what they, what the term is from UT Tennessee? What do they, what do you come up uh, with? It's either a canine or equine rehabilitation, uh, certified canine or equine rehabilitation practitioner. And so that's the C? Um, CERP or the CCRP. Um, so 
their program is a little bit different than the one in Florida in that the veterinary, uh, it doesn't matter whether you're a veterinarian, a vet tech, a physiotherapist, or a physio assistant, um, we all take the same program in Tennessee. So we all take the same program, write the same exam, do all the same um, case studies and all of that. So it's it sort of seems like a really, I don't know if it's a level playing field, but I did that because I wanted to, you know, learn everything. Um, and I'm not saying that they don't, I, I don't have experience with, with the one in Florida, yeah, but they separated. So, so the- I'm trying to get Arlen White to come and talk to us because yeah. I know that she has, so she's a private institute down in Florida. Yes. And, and Stephen Adair's in, at UT Tennessee is through the university. Exactly, so yeah. These, the acronyms are the things that I'm trying to get to because I see them in people's, you know, um, pre uh, suffix. And I, I wasn't totally clear. So CERP is yeah. the degree that you get from UT Tennessee. Exactly. And yeah. CERT, yeah. I believe, is from the Rehab Institute in Florida. Exactly. Yes. Okay. So they are called therapists or assistants. So the veterinarians and, and, and physiotherapists are um, CERTs. So certified equine rehab therapists. And if you are a veterinary technologist then, or a PT assistant, then you're a CERA, so an assistant. So they really believe in a team approach, which I, I wholeheartedly agree with, because I think you definitely need to have um, you know, a veterinarian or a physical therapist as a lead person, because they you know, just have that breadth of knowledge. And we often end up being more the hands-on people and not necessarily designing the programs, but implementing them. Um, although I've done both. So sometimes you don't have all of the people you need. So you become that person. <laughs> and, and I've seen some people that are actually dual certified. They've taken the training in both places. Yes. So and actually, that is my, my plan is to, to do the equine program in, in Florida once we can actually move about. Yes. <laughs> Definitely put a crimp in a lot of styles. But it did. Yeah. Yeah. It's given me time to kind of clarify these things. All right. So we have these, these two programs in the United States that Canada and the U.S. both acknowledge. And so tell us, well, how long was the program that you took at, at UT Tennessee? Mm -hmm. I did what they refer to as the fast track program. So it is two weeks at the university um, full time. I think we had one day off in the middle. And it's basically five modules back to back. So uh, you can do them separately. It just was going to be very cost prohibitive having to travel back and forth. So, um, and I do believe that now the, the initial module, the module one is, is available online. So you don't have to actually be there for that one. But when I did it, you had to actually physically go there. So I stayed on campus and uh, <laughs> for dinner. It's a lovely campus, actually. It's a lovely area. I've been it's there. a beautiful city. Knoxville is gorgeous. Yeah. And I had no idea. I really opened my eyes to that, that part of the world for sure. Uh, so after that, I did an externship, a 40-hour externship. I um, actually had a vet friend in Albany, New York, and I went to see her and spent, uh, stayed with her and practiced in her uh, practice and did my, my externship and just shadowed and learned from the people that were certified there. And then I came back. I had to do five different case studies. I had to do two orthopedic cases, two neurologic cases, and then one just of my choice. And once those were all submitted, then I could go back and uh, present one of the case studies to the group and do a written exam and a, uh, a practical exam. So uh, that was sort of the process. Some people were able to accomplish that in six months, but I took a full year just because getting the case studies done was a lot of work <laughs> and, uh, you know, documenting them. And I mean, it's, it was a, it was a ton of work, but pretty excited about that awesome. um the other new thing for us uh in the vet tech world is is that we have through the north american veterinary ne technologist association there are various specialties that we can apply to be, be part of and so there's specialties in emergency medicine critical care there's specialties in dentistry specialties in um, anesthesia so they've just two years ago, they added physical rehabilitation to that list. And that's a process that um, I'm hoping to work through as, as well, but it's very involved and very, it's, it's, I guess it's sort of the 
vet tech version of a board certification for a veterinarian. So it's, um, yeah. Well, so it sounds like, I, um, it sounds like the whole concept of rehabilitation is really starting to be embraced and we're starting to provide coursework and training for people to become rehabilitation specialists in the United States. Working, I, I would assume always working under the auspices of a vet, under a yeah. who typically is writing the protocol for the treatment. Yeah, it, it depends on what state you're in and as, as uh, what the um, Veterinary Profession Act allows and what kind of supervision is required. Um, so a lot of, I mean, there's even some states, I believe, that aren't, you know, or even they're, they're threatened to lose um, their privileges for even physical this animal rehab, which is really, really sad because there's so many really good people out there helping animals. And uh, <laughs> so it's, it's a challenge. It's a challenging area because there's this sort of gray area. Is it, is it veterinary medicine? Is it not veterinary medicine? I mean, we are, I guess, prescribing exercises or, you know, treatment courses and that sort of thing in, in a way. And of course, as technologists, we're not allowed to prescribe or diagnose. But I can certainly make an observation and say, <laughs> you know, this this horse is unbalanced in this way, and you know, what do you think of this? So I, I feel like it's more of a collaborative approach uh, because often, and and many of the vets I work with would agree that that those of us who do this full time actually probably know more than they do. <laughs> but well, that's they, true in the human world, isn't it? That the doctor comes in and see, the orthopedic sees you, but he sends you to the physical therapist. Right. We recognize that as the, you know, the doctor is not going to spend his time doing your knee rehab after surgery. His right. job is to go back and do more surgeries because that's his specialty. And, exactly. and I think that ultimately I'm hoping that we adopt the model in Europe where we recognize that physical therapy, rehabilitation, whatever you want to call it, is an integral part of the whole picture and it's a team. And it requires the vets to be able to come in and, and see what's going on, make diagnosis, select treatment plans, but then the day-to-day -day, making sure that the horse is getting the rehab that it needs, it, it's going to take, in my opinion, just from what I've been seeing, more than just the vet, who can't be there on a regular basis. You know, you, you, you know he's a, they, you supplement each other. And so um, a lot of owners, because we're not familiar with this concept, especially here in North America, a lot of owners don't even um, know what we're talking about in terms of basic stretches. And I'm sure that you run into this uh, quite often when you know the veterinarian has sent you in on a case and you're having to start educating the owner to basic stretches. <laughs> yeah, I've had, um, I've had some referrals over the years that are quite shocking to the lack of knowledge um, <laughs> because I've, you know, I've found things that were a much more serious injuries than what they thought um, and, and had to send them back to a veterinarian, but more someone with more specialized. And so, you know, I think we all do the best we can with what we know. And I think it's great having people that have a certain level of expertise or certain sensitivity in their hands to feel things. Um, but I, I really think it's a collaborative approach. And, and even when owners find me on their own, I, I always want to consult with the vet. And I always want to say, you know, hey, is this okay? And, and what do you think of this? And because a lot gets lost in the translation as well when you're dealing with an owner and their animal. Um, Mm -hmm. They'll tell you one thing and you think, oh my gosh, someone told you that. And then you talk to the vet and realize that, no, I didn't tell them that. That's what they heard. And that's the translation. <laughs> but, um, and so think it's really don't, like, you don't get the whole story. I mean, it's so classic. I, I had an email from someone and they told me a piece of the story. And so I responded to the piece that they told me. Mm -hmm. And then they came back and said, well, no, I've had all these people look at this horse and they've all done this evaluation and they've done this and this and the horse is fine. And what, yeah. so basically my observation from the little piece of information I had yeah. didn't fit what she knew. Um, and we can only operate from, from our observations and experience. And since, you know, if you're not there to look at the horse, uh, so many things can, be missed or not not recognized as an issue or a problem. Yeah. Um, and I think one of the things from some of the webinars I've been um, hosting that that is really coming home to me is that I think a majority of tendon injuries are actually chronic tendon injuries that finally hit an acute phase. Mm -hmm. That it they the the rare rupture or rare immediate damage is actually probably from trauma more than anything as opposed to 
what we think of as my horse went lame and then it's got a tendon problem. It's not acute. It's been gradually worsening over time and has never been addressed. And so if we can be proactive and get horses more physical therapy and make sure they're more balanced, then we're going to prevent these catastrophic types of injuries. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, sadly, I can say that I've experienced that one myself um, with my own mare and she, you know, I mean, I have it on video when she ruptured her or she tore her suspensory ligament and it was the most benign little move you'd ever seen. So clearly it wasn't a traumatic injury. It was a, a you know, an overuse injury. And, and uh, sometimes I'll admit I'm, I'm a little blind to my own animals. <laughs> we all are. We, believe me, we all are. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, she packed on a bit of weight over the winter and we got back working and, you know, I uh, obviously did not condition her. So, you know, I now share that experience with others because I can empathize with them and say, yeah, I've been there. <laughs> so, uh, that's how we learn, right? I mean, you know, if we think we're going to go through the world and not make a mistake, that's the biggest mistake we're making. Um, and so, but I always tell people, you know, it's, it's not that you have, have made a mistake. It's that you, if you don't learn from the mistake and then do something different, that's when you're really um, at fault. Um, you know, yeah. so, uh, learning moments. I've had many, many, many learning moments. I've even had some recently. So. <laughs> I'm getting tired of learning moments. <laughs> yeah, I know, but I think that's why we're here on this earth. Is but I remember moments. Yeah, yeah. You certainly remember them more when you've experienced them, for sure. Yeah. So, all right. So, you also did a lot of studied equinology, and that's really um, it's sort of like college coursework, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Um. Yes, they, I mean, they only, uh, all of their instructors are either veterinarians or experts in their fields. Um, you know, they recruit the best of the best for all of their courses. So that was one of the reasons I was really attracted to that program because, you know, I wasn't able to travel and go somewhere full time and I was able to do a series of, uh, of workshops and courses, you know, that were very intensive and very um, in depth and and then do the externship work that went with it but you know they have graduated some amazing um like talented people and they've uh, been around a long time yes i mean yeah. i'm not sure what year she started but i think it precedes um dr dare's courses and i and maybe even arlen white's yeah i think you could be right actually and and yeah, i think now they have um they do have a rehab, more formalized rehab program that, and I can't remember the name of the institute, but um, with Nicole Rombaugh and... Uh, oh, okay. Uh, I'll find the information for you. Anyway, um, okay. but, really, but really good people. Because I, I remember, you know, I think it was in the 90s even that there was equinology courses. So I think DeBrain's mm -hmm. been working on that for a very long time and she's had a number, I, I know, Dr. Hillary Clayton, um, Dr. Carrie Ridgeway, John yeah. Zahorek, I mean, some really top, top people. So yes. uh, that's yeah. been a very credible um, experience and very powerful experience for a lot of people taking those courses. And yeah. um, I think for a long time, it was um, almost the only thing available in terms of that level and credentialed. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I'm hoping that we start to see uh, more people embracing and qualifying so that we can have some standards because one of the, I think one of the problems in the United States anyway, is that there are other uh, schools and courses that you can take, but the, the question of whether or not they're in depth enough before you go out and practice um, is always a question. And how do you, how do you determine if someone comes and says, you know, well, I'm an equine body worker, equine massage therapist, um, how do you sort of verify their credentials and their quality before they work on your horse? Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, to me, what, what's happening with the SERP and CERT is it's filling that need of helping us know, okay, this is somebody who's actually been training and they're qualified. Not to say that there aren't people out there that haven't taken those trainings that are qualified, but without any kind of standards, there's no simple way for an owner to evaluate. It's very true, yes. And I think, you know, I think, you know, two things are really important, obviously finding out where they've done their training and, and who they've trained with, but also, you know, are they insured? There's a lot of, mm. 
practitioners out there that are just, you know, throwing up their sign and don't even have liability insurance or, or anything like that. So that's, I think, really, really important as well. And that just shows a level of professionalism. Um, they should be able to belong to one of the, the associations. There's an uh, international association of equine body workers, and they do a lot of um, standardizing of, of care and um, code of ethics and all that sort of thing. So I think it's important to, um, to, to find people that are, that are really invested in the industry and they're not just kind of I think I want to come rub your horse, you know, yeah, <laughs> Get exactly. you some cash. And, and there's also, you know, there's, there's a lot of people, and because there are some people that have recognized the importance of body work for a very long time, there are quite a few really, really qualified people that don't have the certifications. Yeah. Um, it would be, you know, I don't know if a grandfathering program would ever occur where, you know, if, if, but, but you know, that's, that's getting into all kinds of other things, but because there are a lot of really qualified people. And so one of the things to do is always word of mouth, ask people about them. And then what I always tell people, like in terms of a riding lesson is go watch someone work on a horse, not mm -hmm. yours. Mm -hmm. right? And so you can evaluate for yourself. What does your gut tell you? Does this feel like something you want for your horse or does this, do you want to run away screaming because they pulled out the mallets? And, um, and, you know, exactly, right? I mean, <laughs> um, in New Zealand, many years ago, I followed this guy who went from South Island to North Island and everywhere he went was his board and his mallet. And, you know, and I followed b behind him hearing the stories. Um, yeah. So, uh, you know, but it's hard for the individual horse owner unless they have, either they know someone, they're referred to someone by either a vet or a qualified equine professional. Um, to because there's we haven't had a structure and um yes you can get caught up in structures and certifications i've seen that in other situations but there is also the 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 knowing that they have been trained in a certain way and that they have a code of ethics and that they you know uh, are above boards and i think that what we're all trying to do in the end is do the best for our horse do right by our horse absolutely yeah well, I will say that our, our uh, the Alberta Veterinary Medical Association is uh, has been taught. I, was, I used to be on the board for our for our uh, tech association, and um, so I would be involved in a lot of conversations that that led me to you know we're encouraging that they are working towards having sort of a paraprofessional uh, registration with with the Alberta Veterinary Medical Association, so that we can you know, regulate some of these people a little bit more. Um, I mean, I think you can regulate things to death, of course, yeah. but I just feel like it would be nice to have some standard of care before, um, you know, so that even veterinarians could say, oh, they're, they're a member of the association. I feel, I feel comfortable referring to them or whatever the case is. That is a piece of it is that a veterinarian may want to refer and mm -hmm. so that also helps them and it's you know there's it's always where's the middle that's going to be on my gravestone because you have the completely unregulated and they could you know do the weekend warrior course yeah. and don't think they can do anything to your horse and then you have the people that have trained forever um and you can't even find them because they're living under a rock um and you know and everything in between and so um you know that um, webinar after webinar, the, it keeps coming back to having a team to help your horse. And a team is going to include a veterinarian, someone to help with rehab, a really good farrier or barefoot trimmer, so, you know, a saddle fitter, you know, a dentist. It's taking all of these things to make sure that we cover all the bases so that that horse can be as healthy and as happy as possible in his job for his yeah. owner. Um, yeah. And so, so tell us about like, your your work for Delaney. So your uh, lead veterinarian is um, who's your lead? Well, I work I work with the yeah obviously with the whole team. But uh, Dr. Jody Santa Rosa is is uh, has done the rehab training through ARI in Florida. Uh, so and you know is trained in acupuncture and all kinds of different. Um, holistic medicine and whatnot. So she's, she's, she's got a big brain and lots of <laughs> good information. And she's, she's, uh, you know, years of experience working in various um, capacities. So, so the two of us are, are kind of the rehab geeks that are, 
<laughs> as we like to call ourselves, that are uh, spearheading this program. And, you know, we just started getting going when COVID hit. So in some ways, that was a bit of a gift in that we were able to then step back and say, okay, we can't see patients, but, you know, yeah, we can get all the protocols in place and we can mm. get all our forms done and, you know, just lay the groundwork. You know, we've been doing a lot of webinars and things as well, just trying to educate our our client base. And, and like you, I think everyone's really appreciated having that um, that connection, yeah. even, even when we couldn't connect. And so the, um, does she typically write the protocol or do you go out and see the horse together? We, we are actually, you know, it's kind of evolving that way, but um, our, our plan actually is, is to go together as much as possible, especially for that first visit. Uh, so when we do a functional assessment, we will go together and I may collect all the data and the photos and the video and, um, you know, we'll kind of both uh, run our hands over the horse and just see what would be perspectives. And then, you know, we take it home and she evaluates all of the, the video and then we does up a report and, and then we kind of come up with a plan from there. and. And then I typically do the, the hands-on um, implementation. So I'll, I'll meet with the client and um, show them the exercises or do the body work or the laser therapy or whatever it is that, that they need. And um, she, she, does, uh, she also does um, some of the manual therapies, which is great. And, and of course does acupuncture, which I'm not allowed to do. So, um, uh, so that's good. Or she'll tell me what acupuncture points I can use the laser on or we use kinesio tape over the points or something like that. So, so it is a really collaborative approach. And what I love about working with her is that she really feels that all of us are on equal footing. We, you know, we're not, you know, the vet and the tech We're we're the rehab team. And I really appreciate that perspective because uh, I think sometimes we, you know, our little egos are, are get in the way and we feel like, oh, well, I'm just a tech, right? But, but I think, like I say, I, I think most veterinary practices are really, you know, they couldn't do without them. And, and so I think we're such an integral part of the team. And, and this is such a great way to help empower technologists to, to, I don't know, just to give them something that's theirs, you know? Um, well, I think when you have that interaction with the client and with the horse, um, I'm going to say without the veterinarian, but just you, it's very different coming as an assistant to mm -hmm. someone. I mean, mm -hmm. in, in my life of teaching riding, I have used to assist Sally Swift. And mm -hmm. it's so different assisting because, you know, that's where the energy and focus is. And by the end of the day, you're exhausted because your job has been all the support background, but none of the energy has been turned toward you, <laughs> uh, which is fine. But I think then you get to have a, have a, a rapport with the horse and the owner in a different way. Yes. That, um, and it's sort of one step down, you know, it's, I, I want to call it white coat syndrome because even with veterinarians, um, people feel like this is the person who really has the knowledge. And so there's, there's a bit of removal in terms of being able to ask the questions you really want to ask mm -hmm. and interact the way, you know, and, and not everybody has that, but it does happen. And um, with, a, with a tech, there's a um, less intense kind of interaction. And so uh, a client might feel, an owner might feel more comfortable going, you know, I really didn't understand what the vet was talking about. Can you please explain it to me? Yes. You know, that's, that's very true. And, you know, I noticed that, and honestly, my, my former employer used to, uh, he's a good friend of mine now, but uh, he was a, a, a surgeon in, in small animal practice and, and he would purposefully send me in to chat with a client about the surgery or, to, you know, the aftercare or, um, or if there was something that he thought would be, you know, he thought maybe some PRP or stem cell therapy might be helpful, he would send me because coming from me it, it's I don't know if maybe it just felt more genuine and it wasn't just you know because I think there's sometimes this perception that the vet's just trying to sell you something which is bizarre to me because they that's not <laughs> that's not the case but I think it just is almost like you say like sending in the <clears throat> the good guy so to speak to to talk you know one-on-one -on -one and and not feel so intimidated or well and and i know in teaching writing as the clinician a lot of times the students wouldn't come and talk to me to tell me but they'll go to the organizer 
and they'll mm-hmm. tell the, and then the organizer can tell me and I can address it, but they're uncomfortable. They're intimidated and uncomfortable actually talking to the, the expert. And yeah. so they're more comfortable with the associate. Um, yeah. And so I think that that's, I've seen that in my world many, many times. Um, and that I don't see why it would be any different in, in what's going on there. So, so then how often, like if you have, let's say you have a tendon injury, how often yeah. might you be going and seeing that client? Well, it's going to depend a little bit on <clears throat> the client and where they're at in the injury. Obviously, in the acute stage, we'd likely see them more often if, if you know, distance allows. Uh, and, it, you know, as with anything, as you probably know from coaching, is you tell some, you know, tell one person to do, they're going to do it to the letter and beyond. And then you'd give it to another person and they're just, you know, not going to do anything. So, yeah. so I have to, I've gotten pretty good at reading my page, my clients a little bit and saying, okay, are you actually going to do these exercises? Should I just give you one thing or can I give you five things? And (laughs) so um, if they're the type of person who's going to put the work in, I probably don't need to see them as often, but if they need, then we'll see them as often as, as needed. Um, And, you know, that might even be a couple times a week in the beginning and, you know, then we might get to weekly or monthly. So well, and, and each case is very individual. The surefoot because there's some people and they get the surefoot pads and they're, they're hyper dig- diligent, right? And then other people forget to take them out of the bag, yeah. uh, you know, and, yeah. and everything in between. And I think the, the, we want to tend to avoid the extremes because using them, you know, constantly or, or having the horses stand on them for a very long period of time is not helpful and not using them is not helpful. And so again, it's back to my, where's the middle? I literally am going to have that put on my gravestone. <laughs> Absolutely. And when we're keen, we just want to play with our new toys, right? Yeah. And, you know, I had one client like that and, 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 you know, we laugh about it now, but I mean, her horse got really sore and she's like, oh my God, she doesn't even want, she, you know, she tried to bite me when I tried to put her on the pad this time. And I thought, oh dear, we've overdone it. So anyway, we just backed off for a few days and, and she's doing great now. But, you know, I, I don't think early on I realized how easy it is to overdo it and to almost, yeah. So, so I would love you to talk about that a little bit more because I, I, I keep saying this, but having another perspective like what you've seen, because you're fairly new with using Surefoot. It's only been yeah. about six months, if. Oh, has, yeah, yeah. So, so when tell us a little bit more about that in terms of um, overdoing it. Well, you know, I noticed it in, I mean, one of the first dog patients I tried them on as well. Um, she's a senior, uh, senior dog, and, and I mean, I know... <laughs> from years of doing this, that, that you have to go a little easier with seniors. And I think it's the same with horses, whether they are a little compromised in some way or they're older, um, unfit, that sort of thing. I I think I look at it myself. If I go, if if I go into a yoga class and I haven't done yoga in three years, I'm going to be so sore. I can't move. (laughs) And it seems like very benign exercise. Like you're just standing there, right? You're, (laughs) you're, you're, Using, but you're using muscles and finding muscles you haven't found in a while. You're waking things up that, that maybe weren't awake before. So um, some of my biggest challenges, I guess, are, I won't say biggest challenges, <laughs> but um, number one, and you, you know this from experience, is that not all horses want to stand on them perfectly squarely. <laughs> yeah. So I work with a lot of, you know, A-types, and, and I'm kind of one of them, so I, I can identify, but I really have to... Uh, it's really difficult to, to guide people in the fact that, okay, really, you don't need to do anything. This is their choice. If they want to stand on it with their little baby toe, just on the very side of it, and that's what they need, then that's what they're going to do. <laughs> so um, I'm, we're having to get away from the, you know, yep, yeah, nope, that foot is not perfectly centered in that pad. And it's not the foot we wanted. It's, you know, we're, we're going to put it on the back foot because they don't want to lift this one and, you know, just listening to the horse. So I find myself reiterating that a lot. Um, but in terms of overdoing it, yeah. So I had that one dog that was just really tired afterwards. Um, I don't know that she was sore, but she was, she was out for the whole day. Um, horse wise. Yeah. That one horse got quite sore. Um, and again, I really feel like it, it has a lot to do with their current level of fitness and what they do. So if they're used to being out on the trail and 
stepping on and over all kinds of different things and they've got great proprioception and they're fit and you know balanced yeah i think it's a lot harder to overdo it with those guys but if you just pull them out of the field or they've had an injury and haven't done anything um or they're you know quite a bit older like some of my extreme seniors as i call them um they you know they just can't take too much and my approach with them has really just been I'll put them on the pad and just wait for that release. And as soon as they release, I'll take them off because it's almost like, well, it's done its job. They've, they've gotten what they need out of it right now. And maybe we'll do it again tomorrow. We'll do it every second day or, or whatever the case is. But I think it's, you, you know, know I'd rather under do it because it, than overdo it. Well, it seems so simple, right? And, and what, what we can't know is what that horse is feeling and what that horse is experiencing and what that horse is processing. Yeah. And so, you know, to us, it just, well, it's just like, well, it's a no-brainer. You're going to stand on this pad. But, you know, we're not thinking about it from their perspective of, hey, maybe this is really challenging some, some thought, some feeling, some balance or imbalance that we ha don't really understand or can't really experience or see, but they have felt. And it could be something in the past. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I can't tell you how many times, and you've probably started noticing this, you'll, you'll start working with the pads and you'll go, did this horse ever injure? And the, and the owner goes, oh, well, now that you mention it, you know, five years ago, he hurt the shoulder. And, you know, um, because it does bring out old injuries and old patterns. Yeah. And I'm sure you've seen that. I know you have some photos. I do have some, yes. Great. So let's do a little screen share here. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Oh, there we go. I now have my non-spilling drink box. Yay! I'm knocking over my glass of water on these webinars. <laughs> all the time. So um, I thought, I guess what I would do is just maybe show a couple photos and just share a little story about each one of them. I, I have yeah. from, from all these people, so um, they won't mind. But this was the first pad you sent me. It's the half physio pad, which which I really appreciate with, and and that's all I had to work with initially. So you know, I became to, I began to love it because that was the only pad I had. But I still love it. So um, this is a horse who you know we went out to do a functional assessment, and interestingly, interestingly enough, uh, the the farrier was out uh, doing feet, and not his feet that day, but. You know, he's sort of wanted to come and see what we were up to. And and uh, he told us that when he does his feet and he picks up the hind foot, he really wants to hike it up and doesn't want to relax it down behind him. So so we thought, well, let's throw him under a pad and see see what we get with that. And um, let's just do reviews. And so that's him. Uh, and he's, he was just shocked. He's like, this horse never relaxes his foot for me. It just Can you hold one second and let me just check? Because Jody says she can't see the screen, your screen. Oh. I'm just wondering if everybody it, is anybody else having a problem seeing Penny's screen and seeing the picture of, of a very dark horse on a half physio pad? Oh, Jody's on her phone. Oh, Jody. So, so Jody, you can watch the um, you can watch the webinar later on the Surefoot Equine YouTube channel. Um, sorry. Sure, everyone else can see it. Um, I think so. Yep, okay. so we'll do. Yeah, okay. Because nobody else has put anything in the chat, so I think we're okay. All right, roll it. Yeah. <laughs> So anyway, so this, uh, so that was him holding the foot and he's, he normally will, it was just like butter in his hands. He said it was quite remarkable. So he was really excited about that. Um, so I don't know what was going on with him, but, but um, that day it was, was really interesting. Um, I'm, that, that's not my video, so I'm gonna <laughs> pass there, but it just shows some it. Um, again, you know, this is another example of you know, I wanted them to stand on it a certain way and he just wanted to put this other toe on here. And I thought, okay, if that's what you need to do, <laughs> that's what we'll do. Uh, it, yeah. it does really, um, and I'm so glad you brought this up because it does really challenge us in terms of how much control we want to have over the horses. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I, I'm sure that you've seen this when you've gone to pick up a foot and the owner's like, come on, sweetie, pick up your foot, pick up your foot. And the horse is like, I don't want to pick up this foot. Can you do another one? You know, but we get so invested and it's, and I, and it happens to me over and over. It's like, wait, I have to stop and go, that's not what I'm doing. You know, yeah. I have to yeah. listen. I have to tune in and, and listen and figure out what is this horse trying to tell me? Yeah. 
And I found a lot of horses just really want to plant their front feet. They do not want to pick up the fronts. And so then I'll just go to the hinds because, and, and then once they kind of figure out what we're doing, then they're like, oh, okay, maybe I can pick up this front foot. But I don't know if it's just that's their, their base of balance and they just don't want to do it or what the case is. I mean, in this case, um, I think he just had his heel on it. And this was a horse with sore stifles and we, we did some stuff there. But again, just the heel that's that's what he wanted <laughs> that's your photo so i just i stole well that's okay um, we can go back to that one because we're working can we go back that one yeah go back a second so this is actually um dr taylor's picture from ida hammer but what we're what we're now doing is in fact brad just made some they're downstairs as we've we've shortened the the comfort x-ray block to an inch and then added the physio pad to the top of it and glued it together. I'm going to send out some some test blocks just a couple of wow. veterinarians that we have nearby because what happened here was the, the by standing on the physio pad on top of the x-ray block they could see how this horse was loading his foot and then when they were doing forma hoof they actually used the forma hoof in the way that he showed them that he wanted his foot so it's it was just you know one of these happy accidents that actually is going to turn into something i think it's very cool yeah i found that really fascinating and again that went back to what's the horse's preference not what, what do we want for them but what 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 makes them comfortable and i thought that was so was like an aha moment really <laughs> yeah yeah no it's really cool yeah um so this is Wyatt, he's a, he's a 23 year old ex reigning horse and he has some arthritis in his carpi and he frigging loved it. <laughs> um, he, in fact, I walked away and then I came back to him and he, he nickered at me, it was so cute. <laughs> he just was, he just completely zoned out. Uh, I think that's- So if you just turn the sound off on your- Yeah. 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 So um, what was interesting was when I had it under his right front, and I don't have a video of that, um, but I put it under his right front, he kept lifting his right hind and stretching it, kind of like he's doing there. But again, he wanted both feet on there so badly, I wish I'd had a bigger pad, but uh, yeah, that's <laughs> what all they had. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, we're out inside in the wind and there's all this distraction and I realize he's tied and we don't normally recommend that, but he's, he's been tied for years and that's he's happy there so um i wouldn't do that with 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 just any horse <laughs> exactly. um so he was just getting all kinds of releases and stuff through there and was so happy so now we the, the him. In his mane there just <laughs> yeah he's just oh he's just loving this thing so um i think yeah. the rainers are, are are a group that would particularly benefit i haven't uh, gotten into that world that much yet but um, mm -hmm. the when my old rainer I went and I tried sold her to somebody and I went and did surefoot with her it was like somebody had given her you know like a, a boost of you know like raining juice and she wanted to run and spin and stop and, and she was older like in her teens it's like she'd not done anything for 10 years and it just woke her back up it was amazing yeah, yeah. So anyway, I have a lot of Wyatt because he was in. And then he wanted to put both front feet on there. So that was great. We did that and uh, he stood there for quite a while. Um, but I felt okay with him standing on it a little longer just because, so there's still ice on the ground, <laughs> you can see there, but um, because of the stability of that pad. So I don't know if in your experience, you you find that they can stand longer on a yes. hard and, and it's one of the reasons that we recommend it for working with the farrier because you can have them stand on that pad quite a yeah. while. Again, if they if you start to see them swaying a lot, that's one of the clues that you need to shorten your duration. But y yes, with the physio pad, it um, and it looks like somebody's doing his feet back there. Yes, yes, she was. She'll be happy I showed that shot. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I do have permission for her as well. Um, so yeah, he's just he's snoozing after that. Um, sorry, there's no pads in this one. This is Housie. She's. Uh, so she's the one that got sore. <laughs> so she had a bout of laminitis last, last spring and um, she lives several hours away. So she had about a three and a half hour trailer ride to get to us. Oh. And she comes to have her feet done every six weeks and we do some body work. And so we wanted to play with the Sherpit pads and, and, um, and she loved them. I got lots of great releases and things out of her. Um, but it was another case of, you know, we're, we're being a little too keen and probably overdid it. So, um, and how old is she? Was she in one of your older clients? 
Oh, no, I think she's, oh, sorry, Karen, I can't remember. I think she's about eight, maybe. Oh, okay. Oh, all right. Um, she might be older. Don't, don't quote me on that. Uh, she, yeah, so she hasn't, hadn't been working her and um, now she's back to work. She's done some great things. She has wow. uh, can you, created can you that video again. Cause she just made a huge change in her TMJ. Uh, you want me to back up? Yeah. There was this big change in the TMJ. Uh, she turned her head sideways. Yeah. Yeah. So she was a horse that had not been a lot of work and that's, that's always a, uh, yeah, just, just watch the TMJ there. It's going to make a, see it? There's yeah. a little change. And then yeah. When she has a lot of tension in her pole and, and, uh, yeah, and John, and she's had see, some She's looking it right there, right, right behind that left ear. Yeah. Yeah. You can just see those ears yeah. moving. Yep. So that's interesting. She has a lot of tension in her pole because that would all relate. Hyoid, um, yeah. pole, you know, Atlas axis. Yes. She's very cute though, isn't she? Yeah, she's really, she's so, um, in any case, she's, she's done some great things at home. She's, she's bought a number of pads as well, which is great. And she's using them on her other horses. Um, but she's created a uh, sort of an alleyway to her water trough with poles on the ground. So she has to walk over the poles to get to the water trough. So she's incorporating rehab into just her daily routine, which I think is so amazing. And then she would raise them a little bit and, you know, she sends me these videos and it's just, it's so great. And I love, that's what I love about rehab. And it's just this, your imagination is really all you need. You know, it's like, what do we want to accomplish? And, and what do you think we could do to get there? And it's just a bit of a trial and error thing. And, and I think that's a, sort of similar to what the, the Sherfit pads are like. It's, mm -hmm. it's like, well, let's try this and see what kind of reaction we get. And <clears throat> I guess what I'm finding is that they're very black and white about it. <laughs> you know, they, <laughs> they put their foot on it, take it off right away. It's like, nope, not that bad. You put another one on, take it off. Nope. And then you find the right one and they just go to sleep. And, yeah. and it's so interesting to me to see this. I never tire of it. And I'm sure you don't either. At this I don't. Point. I, yeah. It's been eight but, years and I'm still just as excited about the next horse as I was about the first horse. Uh, so yeah. I mean, I have horses that literally kick it to the back. That's yeah. Okay. Yeah. This but it's interesting how she kept her head pretty much over her right front leg the whole time. Yes, and it's the left one that's a bit of a problem, so or yeah. that she's having more trouble with. So um, okay, so that's it. Oh, yeah, yeah. And we got her on some, you know, just variations. And I and again, you know, trying to convince people that you don't have to have matchy matchy pads. It doesn't have to be the <laughs> same one under each foot. You know, so here she just wants she wanted slants on both both that side, and yep. we threw a firm under here and. And so, um, just played a bit. Oh, this is my mare. <laughs> so she finally decided, so she had had a suspensory injury on her right front and, um, and I tried to play with the fads a few times, but you know, she was more interested in eating grass than anything. As you can see, she's, she's a bit of an easy keeper. Um, <laughs> anyway, but she really liked having the pad in this orientation because she, she pronates a little bit, I think. And so I think it was really, felt really nice for her and then I just threw the firm under the other one and and she thought that was pretty great and I think I have a video of her yeah this is a video of her just kind of chilling out but you can you know you can really watch her um her pec muscles kind of move a little bit when yep. they do at some point um it's subtle but it's there I know you can see it and it, yeah. and all I actually up into the point of the shoulder there's a change there too yeah yeah, so so she was just starting to zone out and get that nice, you know, soft eye and the breathing changes and all those things that you talk about that that do happen. <laughs> so, so I have a question for you. Do you ever put your clients, the human clients, on the pads when you're trying to talk to them about their horse? I do, actually, very interestingly. Um, so there's a, a chiropractor, a couple of chiropractors that I work with, and um, they're human chiropractors who are certified at animal chiropractic. And they wanted to try, um, try it on, on their horse. And so Jocelyn has a horse uh, named Archie, who's, who's a bit of a, a special boy. <laughs> and he, I made the mistake of showing him the pad. 
So she told me after the fact that even when she saddles him, she can't show him the pad. She just has to throw it on his back and he's fine. But if you show it to him, he's terrified of it. Oh, so yeah. we got playing with it. He just didn't, you know, it was just like the scary orange pad. So she kept trying to kind of get him used to it and that sort of thing. And then I said, why don't you just, why don't you stand on the pad? <laughs> so she put it down next to him and she stood on it and he started to relax. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it, like, it was like he saw, oh, it's not going to jump up and eat me. What do you know? Okay. <laughs> Maybe this is okay. And then we did get him on the pad after that. But I mean, that's sort of separate. I think what you're talking about is you want people to feel what it's like to be on the pads. Well, you bring up two really interesting points because yesterday in our webinar with Sharon Wilsey, and uh, they were talking about how um, sometimes people have too much, they're too intense when they're coming to their horse. And so the horses get anxious, like with grooming. And if you just kind of turn your body a little bit to, to turn your power center away, then the horses can relax and you're fine. And with Surefoot, I do know that when people get sort of intense about using the pads with their horse, that the horses become more resistant. Mm -hmm. And that when we let go of that, um, and I've seen it, I've seen it. Um, and it almost sounds like the vet may be a bit a little intense. And then when you drop the person down, then the horse was not feeling that intensity and could then accept it. That's very possible. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, we, you know, we, get, yeah. we get frustrated when things aren't going the way we want them to. And then yeah. that just translates to the horse. So yeah. we, we all need to stand on them more often, I think. <laughs> yeah, well, and, and sometimes, you know, if you have a client that's a little upset or a little intense, you know, and concerned about their horse, and rightly so, if you're in there to do rehab, there's something wrong. But sometimes I think if you put them on a pad, you'll find that, again, they'll let down a little bit, and then the horse is easier to work with because they're not feeling the intensity of the owner. So just keep that in mind that sometimes maybe you want to like, um, like I'll put riders on the pads while I'm working with their horse when they're unmounted, yeah. just so that it's, they can get the feeling, but also so that they let down. <laughs> Very interesting. That's that's a good trick. I like it. Yep. Oh, so cute. Um, <laughs> this is Lexi. She has quite a story. She last fall um, was out in the field and uh, fell through some ice that had formed mm -hmm. and was uh, stuck in an icy pond for several hours, maybe four or five hours. Mm -hmm. And the, so there was a whole crew of people that rescued her. And I think it was sort of touch and go, didn't know how she was going to do. But um, so I joined her team when um, just to help with some of the wounds. She had a lot of frostbite and some wounds on her elbows and her stifles and her chest. Um, and her veterinarian thought some laser therapy would help accelerate that, that healing process. So that's where I joined her. Um, but I happened to have the shortcut pads with me. So <laughs> we thought we would try it out. Um, she's doing phenomenally well and those wounds have healed you know, are healing beautifully. And she is actually, she just actually got back on her, I think this past week. Um, so was able to, cause she couldn't put a girth on because she had a, a big wound on her chest. So anyway, she was one that um, didn't immediately take to the pads. She didn't want to stand on them the first couple of times, but this, this day she did. And, and I kept trying the front leg and she started, and I looked at her and she, she was just lifting her hind leg. And I thought, Hmm, you want it under your hind leg, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> so so I put it there and she went oh thank you <laughs> and it was so <laughs> because the owner says to me is that the reaction we're supposed to get <laughs> I said, yes this is the reaction we're supposed to get <laughs> so um so it was a really lovely story and um <clears throat> what a sweet face oh yeah she's a, just a sweetheart um and this is uh, this is Tyson, I think. So he uh, also boards at the same barn, and, and I know his owner. And, and I said, oh, she says, oh, I'd really like some pads. You know, I'm going to go teach a lesson. She has a lot of Pirelli and um, some great things with her students. And um, and so she said, I have to teach. Can you just play with them and see what pads he likes, and then I'll order some. So so Tyson, who's you know been there, done that with everything, was just like, every, he loved every set of pads. Mm -hmm. And I even got him on the pods the first time, which was so interesting. But what I found fascinating was that every different pad got a different kind of release. Mm -hmm. So he released on every single pad, but it was almost like there was just a different look on his face. Like, 
it was it was getting to a different place. I don't know if that makes any sense, yeah, but uh, <laughs> it was really really interesting. And he, like I say, he liked them all, and I just kept playing because he would let me do anything to him. And he's quite a fit horse, so I felt okay with this. We probably spent about forty five minutes just playing, and um, I'd let him off and you know let him walk a little bit in between, but. You know, you can see we've just totally mismatched all these pads. And then, you know, he'd step off one and say, nope, that's too much. And, um, oh, this is... This is and it, it, it's very true that you'll find these horses and they're like, they're just curious about all of it. And so you can mix and match and play and they're right with you. And other horses, it's like, no, I only want one foot on one pad. You know? Yes. Well, and I just took videos because, of course, uh, his owner wasn't able to watch all this. So I thought, well, I'm going to take videos and, and then she could decide which one she thought he liked the best. And, um, in, and he just, you know, he just kept having some really nice, you know, he's just thinking so much there. Um, but I found is the medium pads that he loved the most, I think. Well, I don't know if he loved them most, but he, I certainly got some really nice swaying and releasing and stuff. And yeah, look at his eye, it's really. <laughs> he was just like, oh mama, that's the one. Yeah. <laughs> so um, she's been playing with, and actually a couple of people from the barn have purchased pads so that they have a larger selection to work with. So they're oh, nice. oh yeah, big gulps and yep. So, and, and so sometimes um, when I have a client and the horse likes all the different pads and they're like, well, I, 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 right now I just want to get one set. A lot of times what I'll do is I'll actually have the owner stand on all the pads and choose the one they like also. Mm -hmm. um, and very often it's the same one as the horse, you know, uh, seems to like the best. So, um, but it does, and those horses also, it's kind of like when you, when you find a horse that likes a lot of different things, coming back to medium is not unusual. Um, yeah. Medium isn't a pad that I ever really start with because it's so springy. But when, when you find that horse that really likes medium, it's like, it's like a treat. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and she's commented that she's had some amazing rides um, oh, super. since she yeah, started them. so I'm just yeah it's really uh, really rewarding uh, so yeah that's it is and, and I think that's one of the best things about Surefoot is it is rewarding to see the horses really let down and and hear the change in performance and calmness and relaxation it's just yeah it's addicting it's so expressive so I really enjoyed watching him just express himself yeah um oh yeah and then we got him on the pods which he also loved and interestingly and i'll find I have a video there too yeah this is what he loved the most which was so again he's not on it firmly he just chose to just stand with the you know his oh, foot yep yeah so he got some really nice releases of that too and you have to wonder with the little bit of supination how that's influencing everything up the chain. And, you know, again, we can't feel what they're feeling. We can only watch and look at what they show us to make the decisions that, yeah, this is cool, but he's really, you're right. He's really enjoying that. Yeah. Yeah. And what was really interesting was, so I've never performed any body work on him. Um, I know him through, you know, we do working equitation together and, um, so I just kind of ran my hands over him before I started and he was really tight in his low lumbar area and I did not do, I didn't really, I didn't touch him. I just worked him on the pads for that 45 ish minutes and I went back and felt that part of his back and it had totally released. It was nice and soft and just happy. And I thought, Oh, I didn't have, <laughs> I didn't even have to touch you. <laughs> so I think, you know, these pads are such a great tool, even between bodywork sessions, right? So yes, we do exactly the work, right. but then you can, then you can, you know, the owners can do it at home and help, you know, solidify some of what we've done or just further release it. And then we can come back and, you know, just peel away all those layers of, of, you know, tension or whatever pattern, movement patterns that we, that we have. Yeah, I feel like you can, the uh, owners can help maintain or even improve in between, oh, goodness, as opposed <laughs> You know, so Chloe. <laughs> pushing up the hill and coming back down. This is too cute. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know she posted these on the fans of Sherpit page. Um, yeah, still so cute. <laughs> yeah, she's adorable. So she has terrible feet, as you can see, but they're they're working on those. And um, so this is a rehab facility that's north of our city, a couple of hours, and 
Um, they, you know, that's, they've got all the fancy tools, the underwater treadmill, the vibe floor, the, you know, solarium, all that stuff. Um, and interestingly, so while we were there, we decided to, cause she'd asked me about using the surefoot pads on the vibe floor. So I said, well, let's try it. So I just put a runway of all the different pads on the vibe floor and then we went and stood on them and I stood on just the vibe floor and then I stood on the pads on the vibe floor. And we all kind of experienced different sensations, but for me, it, it almost intensified it. It was really interesting. Hmm. Um, so, because I know that came up as, as a question in, in yeah. one of the webinars. Yeah, because, um, you know, I think sometimes be, it might feel good to us, but we don't have the same hoof construction. And that's, what, that's where my concern comes in, is um, given that they have an encapsulated foot and given that the lamina are sensitive, yeah. um, that that's where my concern comes in but I, you know i mean for us to stand on it and feel it the fact that it intensifies kind of uh reinforces that sense for me that was my thought as well and you know i said i said well if they are <clears throat> regulars on the vibe floor <clears throat> excuse me and and are really experienced with it then yeah maybe you could try it but i i, I did instinctually feel it would be too much almost right yeah I think yeah. it's kind of two separate modalities. That's probably the only one where I feel that strongly about it yeah. being separate. Yeah. Um, interestingly, with this with this uh, mini here, the way the foot um, rolled in, the orientation, and again, you know, we're we're projecting what we think is going to work. <laughs> um, it actually sort of exacerbated it, which which we thought was really interesting. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, um, yeah, so we just kept playing and of course she's starting to yawn there. So that was really cute. <laughs> oh, this is one of my dog patients. Uh, so this is Nina. And sadly, we lost Nina almost two weeks ago. Oh, she had some cancer, but um, she sure enjoyed her sessions up until then. Um, I started seeing her about a year ago. She was a little rescue from Mexico who had puppies. And um, it was a great story, actually, because she had uh, they found her and she wouldn't leave this area and they ended up following her and realized that she had puppies hiding somewhere mm -hmm. and so they were able to res rescue the puppies as well and one of her friends um, actually adopted one of the puppies so so they were still able to visit each other periodically but anyway that's aside so I wanted to play with with her a little bit on the pads and um, what I found I guess for years, even when I was in canine practice, I didn't have a lot of space in the clinic to evaluate gait and, um, you know, do lots of movement stuff if we're real luckier in the equine world. But uh, so I would watch their path, their posture while standing on different things. And so I would often use just a physio pad just to see how they're weight bearing and, and you know, which leg they're shifting to and how that affects their whole body. And so I find that the Sherfoot pads are great for sure pause pads are great for that because you get that nice foot impression as well. And so you can kind of look and see, you know, you know, oh, really, really weight bearing on this foot versus that foot or whatever the case is. And so, and I, you know, I have this conversation a lot with, uh, I work with agility clients and, and they can do some amazing dogs. And, but, but I think what we sometimes, minimizes the importance of standing still <laughs> so you know yes they can jump and move from one place to another but can they hold a posture for any period of time and so i i like these because we can then just have them hold a posture and i think that is really impactful because sometimes less is more as you know yeah. Um, so I'm just playing with different things she took some photos for me so that was kind of yeah. nice she had some weakness in her hind end um, but yeah, she could barely stand when I started seeing her a year ago. And, you know, by this time this year, she was, she was doing really, really well. So she was running at the dog park. So it was really rewarding. Um, this is a big new feed that I, so this is a different use for the, for the pad. Oh, okay. <laughs> He's a 12, 12 year old Newfoundland. Um, but I felt like he had some sore hips. So I felt like it would be nice to kind of use it as almost a bolster. So yeah. he laid like that while I worked on other parts of him and um, he really liked it. So again, I'm just thinking of different. different yeah, no, that's a great, yeah. great thought. I, I would, it, had never thought about that. I it's know. So I'm just experimenting lots and lots of needles. Let me just go. Sorry, I'm going to make you dizzy. I oh, no, these are great. They're so cute. 
And, and so, you know, fit pause, the, the difference between sure, uh, sure pause and fit pause is that all our pads are the same materials as the horse pad and they give to heat and pressure, whereas the others are air filled. And I think it's a very different experience. I, th I, I don't think you can say one versus the other. I just think they're entirely different. And especially yes. your older dogs and your weaker dogs, yeah. ha having to deal with the unstable surface, air filled unstable surface, um, I think is a bit challenging, whereas this is going to give to them and offer that same kind of comfort that we see with the horses. Yeah, and I, and I like that, <clears throat> excuse me, that you can, ta uh, you can stack them so that, you know, because often what I, my goal is to shift a little more weight to the hind end, because it's always hind end weakness that we're seeing. So if I can raise the front, then we're shifting weight to the hind. And so it's a really nice way to have a nice stable surface for them to, you know, you can do all kinds of configurations. So, yep. um, awesome. This is another old timer. This is Goose. I think he's about 28. Uh, he has arthritis in his carpus as well. And I think he's had some laminitis. Um, <clears throat> he's a bit of a hot mess, but he's a sweetheart. Yeah. <laughs> and this he is the first time on the pads. Like he, doesn't he? He's like he's very, um, still very engaged in the world. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. He's, he's, you know, it's like, yeah, I may not look, you know, quite what I used to, but I'm still here. So, yeah. um, and actually there was another horse, so this is this these horses belong to um, uh, Lindsay one of the people that I work with at, at Delaney so so she won't mind me sharing uh, she has a horse that had a we think a fracture in her cervical vertebrae at some point um, that's now healed but she's left with a bit of a head tilt and it made me think about your horse with the Lyme disease so we thought well let's let's try her on a pad and she she's really reactive and really sensitive. And, um, and I wonder, you know, we wonder if, if she doesn't just have like this massive migraine from her, you know, the way your head is for, <laughs> and that's, that it's just created this, this hypersensitivity. In any case, we put her on, I think the physio pad and just put a front foot on there. Maybe 15 seconds. And she went, she, you know, she walked away and started releasing and yawning and shaking her head. And like, it was just like we unwound something and it was so interesting to watch. But again, we couldn't have done any more with her. That was enough for her that day. So yeah. um, Lindsay's got some pads now and she's going to play with her a little bit more, but it'd um, be really interesting to see how she progresses. For yeah. Sure. Uh, oh, that was good. Oh, <laughs> I had to show this one. So this is a big shire. <clears throat> so I wasn't sure how to, you know, how to deal with this one. So the vet, we got called out because this horse needed some sedation to have his, her, her feet done because um, she's quite painful in her front feet specifically. And so she's actually sedated as we do this, um, which intuitively I thought might not be a good idea, but we thought let's just try. <laughs> and um, she was way more willing to lift that hind foot with their and it was so, so interesting. You can see here, uh, I think this picture shows how big her foot impression is. Wow. <laughs> That's a half physio pad, which I don't know what the dimensions are, but. Um, 16 by 12, and that foot is <laughs> more than half the length of that massive. pad. So, that, so that's like a nine to 10 inch long foot. Yeah. 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 So basically, so, um, big pretty foot. incredible. Uh, not under both hind feet, which was great. Yeah, I can't see over top of her. She's, she's, you can get her the scale there a little bit. Um, and I had a picture of it with her front foot on, but I somehow it got missed, I think. Um, in any case, she did not want to take her, her left front foot off of there. She just planted it. And in fact, she was kind of a little, a little drunk, so she swayed backwards and then just kind of stood there, but she was not gonna let go of that pad. It was just wow. <laughs> really interesting. So the owner- yeah. And the hope there is that you can wean her off the drugs. Well, exactly, that's, that's my hope, um, is that she'll start to become so comfortable with the pads that we won't have to sedate her to do the feet. Yep, and you might even consider using the full hard pad, the two inch hard pad, given She'll, she'll take up the entire pad. <laughs> yes, yes. We did try to get her on that pad, I think, and I didn't get a picture of it, but I think we actually did get her on the hard pad. Yeah, and it might have been too much that day, but once she starts to understand the physio pad, I think, I think it'll just have more structure for her size. You know? Yes. 
that's yeah. what I'm looking at because she obviously enjoyed this pad. Um, she did. Yeah. That's that's a huge foot. That's a huge, <laughs> huge foot. And then I think my last one here is just uh, this is zero. So she's one of my regular canine patients. I still see. I still have a few that I've kept because I I couldn't abandon them um, when I when I moved on to equine practice. But um, she has arthritis in both elbows, and and so we do some physio with her to to help with that. But she really liked the pads too. Um, well, I have to say that all of your clients look very smiley. <laughs> Pretty happy, yeah. <laughs> I have liver. <laughs> yeah, um, and then this last one was just an example of again how they, how some of them choose to stand on pads in in weird ways, and you don't understand why. But we don't have to. That's the they, nice. They like it, so yeah. So I think that's that's all I have for photos that's and videos. Awesome. That's those are great pictures. Thank you so much Stop. for sharing that. So you know, it's really fun to see that that you know, this is where Surefoot is such a shining star because it can help in so many ways. And it doesn't have to be the only thing you do. It can be just part of the process of what you do, whether that's including laser or other treatments or stretches. And, um, and, I, and you brought up the idea of how can you just incorporate it as part of your daily life as opposed to having to make it a big deal. Mm -hmm. And I think that's also another thing, like uh, a lot of times when I start with a horse, and I'm sure you're finding this too, you know, I do a session that's just surefoot to just get the horses understanding what we're doing, you know, we're making this offer. But then it's a question of how can you kind of include it, even if it's just a couple of minutes into your daily routine, so that it's just part of it. And so you're constantly pinging the system and reminding it that it can, you know, the horses can find the comfort, find the relaxation, find the balance. Yeah. And with your with your older guys, you know, we're not going to solve some of those needs, but if we can make them more comfortable, they're just, you know, it's like us. We just would like to live at our old age and comfort and not aches and pains. We would. We would. I, I actually, I have some clients who, who are now incorporating them into their grooming routine. So, awesome. um, you know, having them stand on the pads while they're grooming, you know, getting ready to, to tack up or or just, just for a grooming session. Um, we yeah. do a lot of, um, Dr. Santa Rosa does uh, what she calls a grooming with intention. And it's a, uh, so it's a full handle. We actually do full workshops um, oh, with the grooming with intention. And, it, and it's really just about not just knocking the dust off your horse, but you know, stimulating different parts of the body with different types of textures and firmnesses of brushes and you know, encouraging lymphatic um, movement and, all that sort of thing. So it just, it fits really well in with, with some yeah, of like a spa day. day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Well, this has been fabulous. I've really enjoyed this and it's so nice to get some clarity on some of the things with the, with the um, technician aspect. That was great because I, I, you know, it's all been a little jumbled in my head. So this really helps me understand it a little bit better. And it's just really fun. Thank you for sharing your, your clients with us because it, it looks like you have a great bunch up there in Canada. Uh, we, we have such a keen group. It's, a, it's been amazing, actually. Yeah. So I appreciate them uh, allowing you to share their photos. That's really great. And, um, and thank you so much for being my guest today. Well, thank you for having me, Wendy. I, I feel like I'm in, in a... In, amazing company it's i'm just you know humbled that you asked me to join you today because you know some of the guests you've had are are people i've followed and and idolized for a long time so i really appreciate the oh yeah no it's been great and you know again i I'm keep trying to add more different aspects to this picture because again it's the team approach and the more clear we are and understanding each role in that that then we can embrace it as opposed to go, well, I don't know what you're doing, or I don't know what you're, you know, and how am I supposed to like, nope, it's a whole approach. And as we understand the pieces, we can then call on them as we need them and utilize them to the best of our advantage so that our horses benefit. That's the whole point. That is. <laughs> We're doing this for the horses. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And that's what's been so great about the webinars is that my guests are all recognizing that this really is for the horses and um, and it's, again, I've just had such amazing feedback from people and, uh, I'm having, um, the Equisoma people are returning on the 24th and they're going to talk about the thoracic spine. Oh my God, I, 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 know, I was so excited about that. I was like, just act like you're talking to a sixth grader. Don't worry about it. <laughs> so it's like, it's really in depth. I know, but you got to keep it simple for us. Just, <laughs> but, um, I want the in-depth stuff too. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> So, 
So thank you again, and thank you everybody for joining us. Tomorrow my guest is Dr. Joyce Harmon, and we're gonna talk about acupuncture and get some clarity there. Um, just remember that you can find all of the webinars on my Surefoot Equine YouTube channel, and you can sign up for any of the webinars by going to the surefootequine.com website, click on the calendar, click on the date, the box will pop up. When you click on that box, there'll be the registration um, in blue and you can just hit the register and join on. All right, and thank you again, Penny, and everybody have a great day and we'll see you tomorrow. Thanks, Wendy. Bye.